Well, I am beyond thrilled to introduce you to Alex Kudinov. And Alex, I think I pronounced your, your name correctly. Um, and gosh, I, I am really excited because there, his listing of credentials could probably take us the remaining of the time. So brace yourself for this one. So he is a PCC. He's a board certified coach. He's a Scrum Alliance certified enterprise coach a certified team coach and a professional scrum trainer with the scrum with scrum.org and a Canaban coaching professional and an accredited Canaban trainer with Canaban University. So extremely long list of credentials. But as a professional coach, Alex believes that clients have everything they need to achieve their goals. They are naturally creative, resourceful and whole and do not need fixing. So what they need though is support, a different way of looking at things, a soundboard, a partner in their journey in achieving their life goals. So he holds an MBA from the University of Texas at Austin and a master's degree in banking and finance from the All Russian State Distance Learning Institute of Finance and Economics. With that, Alex, we wanna thank you in advance for the time that you have put into preparing to share your message with us today. Um, and I know, Teresa, if you can stop share. Alex, are you prepared to take over? And then I will turn it over to you. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Tyrus. Thanks, uh, everybody, for joining in and spending a little bit less than an hour listening to this presentation. Um, thanks, Tyra, for not tiring to go through the list of my credentials. And I stopped putting those three letters after my name when they became longer than my name. Um, so, um, but uh, that's not what really defines me. Um, I think, uh, as Tyra mentioned, that um, I came to coaching by the way of, uh, by the technical path. I've been a software developer for quite some time and went into management and realized that we technical people actually suck at working with people. Uh, got into coaching and it was uh, life-changing. Uh, it was uh, really life-opening um, and it became uh, a new career. And um, last year, um, Shoei Silas and I, we partnered to uh, organize Tenum Coaching Academy where we teach and train uh, coaches of all walks of life. Uh, we started focusing primarily on agile coaches. And uh, so we have these programs, we have supervision and Shoei will be talking to you in a month about supervision. So so uh, I'm really excited to uh, be there as well. But today I wanted to talk to you about uh, a little bit different thing. And um, it's about negotiation. And you kind of saw a preview kind of warm up question uh, during the breakouts. And I got nothing to do with that question. <laughs> um, but um, what I heard, uh, it does really resonate uh, with what this presentation about, and I hope you will find it, if not uh, something absolutely engaging and something absolutely invaluable, I hope you will take away one or two ideas that you can take to your business, that you can take to your personal lives, that you can take to whatever you're doing, uh, because negotiation is the way of life and we negotiate everywhere. Thanks God we don't have to go to grocery stores and negotiate the price of loaf of bread. That would have been interesting. But you know what, there are countries where they do that. So, uh, and it's kind of interesting. Um, I will refer to my MBA for several times. I did it in 2007, 2009. And one of our professors said, um, you people are talking how you hate politics, how you ha hate office politics, and you are in business program. And if you want to become great business leaders, you cannot hate it. You have to embrace it because that's the way of life. And when I hear I hate negotiations, especially from business professionals, I'm like, Mm, I'm not particularly sure that's the right way to look at that. So um, I will start with my presentation. Uh, again, my hope is not to give you something groundbreaking. I'm not myself a negotiation professional. Uh, there's nothing, no three letters after my name that says negotiation, whatever. 
Uh, but uh, I've been fascinated with the topic. Uh, I've been uh, running the business and we had quite a few negotiations um, ongoing, failing and succeeding. And so, so hopefully these pointers you will find useful, some of them. And with that, um, to make it a little bit more interactive, I would like you to grab a blank piece of paper and we will do a bingo. So grab a piece of paper and fold it as shown on screen. I figured out that if I put this in the words and kind of try to write out how you need to fold this piece of paper, I will need more than one slide. So fold it so that you have nine squares or just kind of put lines there so that you have nine squares. And in a moment, I will show you words that you will have to pick and choose and put one word per square. So here are the words. Pick and choose whatever, whatever looks at you, whatever picks your attention, whatever you like. I'm curious what the heck that is and fill out those nine squares. And the way it's gonna work, I hope everybody know what, how bingo uh, is played. So uh, as I'm going through the presentation, when you see a word on screen or you hear me saying that, cross it out. And when you have filled out sheet with all the words crossed out, please yell the, your loudest, bingo, and we will have a prize for you. If two people will have bingo at the same time, the one who yells bingo loudest will win. There will be no two prizes. All right. Uh, I will give a couple more seconds to fill out your bingo sheets. All right. And of course, you already know this. I already told you that our life is full of negotiations. Negotiating with a spouse, with children, your employer if you are gainfully employed or with your business partner if you are in a partnership. Oh, heck, somebody said the, the toughest negotiation you have is negotiating with yourself. There you go, right? with auto mechanic for any other services that you get. The last one is interesting, and we will have a question around this. With your favorite deity, how you handle that one? I'm really curious. So, and there are multiple ways you can go with these negotiations. You can go for win-win, you can go to split the difference, you can go to find the golden middle, you can go for a win, you can go to destroy your adversary, whatever your negotiation is, tactic is. But when you split a difference, or when you go for yes, or when you go to, when you strive for win-win, or when you cave and avoid, that's what's going to happen. Imagine you and your spouse go to a, to a theater and you want to wear black shoes and she wants you to wear brown shoes. If you split the difference, that's the way you're going to appear in the theater. Probably not the best appearance, but what I know. Um, and uh, so what I want to, what I want to kind of make it come across is that there's a, here's the first never in this presentation. Never compromise on your goal, never. And in order to never compromise on your goal, you need to know what your goal is. And you need to have a very clear definition. What do you want? And compromise, if you decide to do that, hopefully what I say next will kind of make, give you a stop there. So compromise is it's a quite lazy way to get past an impasse or an obstacle. And it will create an illusion of movement. It's a create an illusion of progress in the absence of good communication. So will you always get your way? Probably not. Will you have to yield something in order to get something or e even yield something in order to get moving? Probably. But know exactly why you're doing that. Know what you are giving up and what you're getting in return. Why movement is important, maybe it isn't, and we'll talk a little bit uh, about the goals and setting them. Compromise, compromise for the sake of movement, uh, it's quite a random move. And as one of my favorite uh, characters, the Cheshire Cat said, if you don't know where you're going, every road will get you there. So hopefully you get this first message, never compromise on your goal. 
And if some of you, as I, were fortunate enough to go through any kind of uh, negotiation course or maybe MBA program, and they love negotiation course for MBA students, you probably heard all of these acronyms like BATNA and ZAPA and WIN-WIN and get into YES, which is a staple of all the MBA uh, program books, uh, splitting the difference. So what I want you to think about is to forget all those. Maybe not forget all those, but forget everything that you learned in your MBA programs about them. And just because they don't work, just because MBA programs have been teaching these for decades and it doesn't work. So keep calm, laugh, and forget about them. And with that said, um, just to kind of um, bring in a little bit interactivity into this, please open in a different window or on your mobile device. Uh, go to www.menti.com and enter code 76593694. And there will be a couple questions there. What I would love us to know and to answer this question, how much you love, hate negotiations and how proficient are you at negotiating in different contexts? It's your self-assessment. I think the voting is open and there will be kind of two sliders. Um, one is love-hate negotiation in four contexts, business negotiation, personal negotiation with friends and family, goods and services like plumber, mechanic, farmer market, whatever that is, and DT negotiation. Negotiation about fate, karma, afterlife, so I'm really curious uh, where this group of people is on um, this. Um, hey, we got some first results. They will keep coming. All right. Um, so let's not wait any longer. Here's the second question. Your gut feel, your intuition. What is the first word, first emotion that pops up when you have to negotiate? Just enter one word. Nice, eek! Okay. Hmm. All right. Just press, go. Okay, love it. All right, so um, not particularly seeing any love given to negotiation process, and that is fine. So I will close the voting now and go back to this slide. So um, again, you don't have to love it, but you have to recognize this is the way of life and this is how, this is what we do day in, day out, right? So um, the first concept I want to bring it is that you don't really need it. You don't. Every time I hear I need this, I need this, and especially in the context of negotiation or when I coach a client who is about to go into negotiation and they talk about needs, every time I pull them back and ask him, what is that do you really need? You don't need this contract. You don't need this next client. You don't this need this next uh, sale. And probably we all here know the Maslow's pyramid of needs. And this is another classification that I came across just recently, probably a couple of months ago, as I was getting into the nonviolent communication. Um, uh, so they have this uh, classification of needs and this kind of picture is not representative of the biggest need or kind of strongest need or pyramid of need. These are just all the needs, all nine needs that we actually have. Right. So having that next sale is not here. It might be that having the, the next sale will support you and will give provide you for sustenance. Right. So that's a different story. And we will talk about that in a moment. However, a lot of things that we say we need, we don't really need, but we really want them. And as you go into negotiations, it would pay huge benefit to tell yourself just that. I don't need to close this deal. I want it, 
I would be better off if I do, but I don't need it. Right? And that's a great mindset to get, to get behind the negotiation table. And that's a great mindset to, to have when you sit across your negotiation adversary and kind of have having hits from all over, right? That gives you real clarity and really opportunity to say, you know what? I don't need it. Here's what I want and I can walk away. Right? With that said, before you get into what you need and what you want, you need to know your outcomes. We talked a little bit about goals. So how do you set these goals? How do you set these outcomes? How you define them? And those of you who are familiar with NLP, with neuro-linguistic programs, uh, will find this material very uh, familiar, right? And I find it really useful uh, when I work with the clients and when I work with uh, their goals and helping them to identify their goals. What I also found useful is that when I go into negotiation, it really pays off to get behind that negotiation table, whether it's physical or virtual, with a really good set of well-formed outcomes, with really knowing what do I want, right? Not only what do I need, we talked about that, but what do I want, right? And in order to do that, right, well, first of all, it needs to be positively stated. It cannot be, I want to get rid of something. That's never going to work. I want to achieve something. I want to gain something. I want to make move on something. State in positive, um, positive uh, terms. Put it in your life context. What will become available to you in your environment? It's kind of the NLP thing. Acquire sensory acuity. Take your own self into the future and it's kind of it's kind of weird to coach yourself on this but it's a really interesting process acquire the sensory acuity what will i see hear and feel your kind of classic vac visual auditory and kinesthetic when i achieve this goal and when you really get into this sensory mode does it feel right do you see the right things? Do you hear the right things? And it's okay not to see, hear, or feel the right things. It basically tells you something that maybe your outcome is not as desirable or as good as you thought about it before you got into this uh, exercise. It got to be evidence-based. Um, it's basically your measurements, right? How do you know you got what you wanted, right? And Notice that here we're talking about outcomes. We're not talking about outputs. We're not talking about um, like I earned this amount of money or I signed this contract. What will I have when I have this contract signed? How my life will change when I have this money? How my business will grow when I have these clients or I sign up these clients, right? Um, always good idea to make sure that your outcomes are ecological and you look at the bigger picture and at the bigger ecology where you're working in, not only your business, outside of your business, outside of your region, maybe your family and everything that's in between and we want to include in there. Make sure it's in your control. When you get behind the negotiation table, one of the best things you can do is to ensure that what you want is in your control and you are capable of getting that. Make sure that the goal that you're setting is your goal, not your spouse goal, not your partner's goal, not your whatever co-worker's goal. It's your goal, right? And at the end of the day, resources are available, resources that you need. And something to be said about when you actually need it, right? If you basically say, you know what, Alex, this is all BS. That's not what I want. That's what I really need. Because without that, I will lose my uh, a roof over my head or I will not have bread on the table. I really need it, right? So figure out what is the smallest thing you can get out of this negotiation. What is the smallest outcome you need to go, you really need to go after, right? If something is not on your, in your control, slice it smaller. Think about, think about uh, the power of getting locked into something you really don't, you, you, re you really <laughs> desire, but you really need it. This doesn't mean that you should dispense with absolutely fantastic tool of anchoring that we'll talk about a little bit later, but 
still have your eyes on the smallest piece you really, really, really absolutely need. There will be times when you, when you need it. And so how do we go about slicing it? Well, you chunk it. And again, your NLP practitioners here are very familiar with this concept of chunking up and chunking down. So um, people have a, a particular range of levels um, in the hierarchy of ideas they are comfortable with. Some are the big picture thinkers and some are kind of down the weeds and some are in between and some are really good everywhere, right? So uh, when you are chunking up, when you are achieving to a, a, an agreement and when you're getting out of the weeds, if your negotiation or Maybe your, co uh, maybe your coach or client in the session gets down in the weeds and you take them up, you get them to the 10,000 feet kind of view, that's your chunking up, right? And some questions that you might be asking is, what are we trying to achieve by this? That's part of what? That's example of what, right? So we're taking them from, up, from down the weeds and we're taking them up and making them see a bigger picture, right? Absolutely fantastic tool to use behind the negotiation table. Chunking down is getting away from groupthink, uncovering the unspoken differences, and maybe getting more information about that specific thing that is preventing you as the negotiation group going forward. Some questions that might be useful there are, what's an example of that? What are some parts of that? What's the meaning of that? One question I love, what will it mean in practice? How are we going to implement that, right? That makes people to go from high level, from really big idea, and start digging in and uncovering more of the differences or similarities and focusing on where you can find that common ground, where you can, where you can start finding the agreement point. But be careful about chunking, chunking it down too much. Uh, you always want negotiations about many issues. My most dreaded negotiations are only about one issue, and that is usually price. That is not a good position to be in because, I mean, yeah, they are here, you are here, and then you start either uh, devaluing your value or they start feel bad because they are not paying you too much, these negotiations usually don't go anywhere. You don't want a single issue negotiation. Those are easily to get emotional and uh, those are much easier for you to cave, much easier for you to start splitting that uh, valuable difference. So as you're chunking things down, uh, don't throw the chips that you're chunking off of the table. Keep them in the pile on the table and basically saying, these are still things in play. We just want to see where to start and what's good to agree on. So here's your chunking up and chunking down. Always know what you are asking and how you are asking this, right? And it's kind of funny. Uh, and the reason I love negotiations is because it's so close to coaching. I didn't believe it at first when I started getting into that, right? Um, and all the competencies and all the skills that we have as coaches are so applicable in negotiations. So the reason you probably might laugh because if you read that clear, direct, primarily open-ended questions, that's nothing else that a PCC marker from ICF coaching competencies. That is exactly what we are trained to do and what we practice day in, day out. And these, uh, these kind of questions they come in different forms and different shapes. Uh, one of my favorite authors, Chris Voss, uh, in his Never Split the Difference book, he calls them calibrated questions. And so what you can do here, the best questions that you can come up with is how can I do that and its variations. This puts your adversary in your own world and it invites them to help you solve your problem. That's fantastic. That's fascinating. And unless you are negotiating with a gang leader uh, who is comfortable with saying, how do I know how to help them do what I said or your favorite poodle will die in 24 hours? Well, you will probably most likely will have a thinking partner that will help you. And they will give you so much more information in the process that you can use for your advantage in identifying how 
you achieve your goals. Decide which information you're missing. Uh, maybe for that well-formed outcome to become a really well-formed outcome and keep asking a variation of how can I do that? A variation of that might be, uh, I appreciate your offer, but knowing our constraints that I laid, uh, laid out earlier, how can I do that? So uh, it's kind of same idea with, uh, we know the one of the powerful question in coaching and what else. And when I hear coaches asking that multiple times, I'm like, can you ask something different, some variation of that? Just stop asking and what else? What are some other things? It's so easy. It's so easy. We have, we, we, we usually coaches have such a rich vocabulary. So I think it's easy to find how to rob this, how can I do that in many, many, many robbers and figure out how to ask that and still pull your adversary into solving your problems. Use buts. This is probably one of the places where I recommend to use buts. We all know the and, yes and, right? Because we always know that Anything that's said after but is where their attention goes. That's where you want to use buts. You want them to focus on what you want. It's a great offer, but great but. Use that and put what you want after that but. That's what attracts their attention. And as you get all that precious information you want, do not spill the beans. And Cherie is laughing because that's her slide. Do not spill the beans. This is another fantastic skill that you absolutely, uh, and it should be second nature to coaches. We are trained to do that. We listen more, we speak less, and we are comfortable with silence. And if we're not, I mean, what are we doing? At least I think so. Um, and actually I had a student last night in the class who practiced asking open-ended powerful questions. And he went like, what is possible here? Pause. And then I kept silence and he's like, like, would you like to? And I. I, I shit him, like, shh, stop, right? You should shh yourself when you do same thing in negotiations. The longer you talk, the greater chance you give the other side more information than you need to. You absolutely don't need them to give them information. And I'm a big fan of the, uh, of the West Wing, uh, kind of from early 2000s. And there's absolutely fantastic scenes there where, uh, where the White House counsel, uh, he prepares the press secretary for her interview with the Congress, and he asks a simple question, what's the time? And she look at it, and she's like, well, it's 12 past midnight, um, past noon. And he looked at her and like, what's the time? And she pauses. He, he asks, do you know what time is, right? And she answers with the time. And he pauses, and he looks at her, and he repeats, do you know what time it is? And she says, yes. That yes should be your answer in the negotiation conversation. Answer the questions that you are asking. And as coaches, bring your beautiful, powerful, open-ended question to the conversation so that people feel like they need to spill their beans and you keep your beans tied. Another thing, stop saving them. Somebody was talking uh, before this presentation and they were like, well, I'm negotiating against myself. Well, not only are you negotiating against the, yourself, you're saving your adversary. And when I say adversary, it's just a term we use in negotiation. So it doesn't have to be a war, right? It's just somebody who sits across the table, negotiation table. You cannot save them. And you are not in business of saving them. Oftentimes we discuss... Uh, a piece of negotiation or an issue that's coming up in nego negotiation, uh, Sheree and I, and we're thinking about uh, the proposal, we come with great proposal. And then she adds, oh, that might not work for them because of this and that. Why don't we? So there are two sides to this. There is a great side. She thinks about what might come up. Absolutely fantastic, great, that's awareness. That's what we need to have as business owners. The bad side, why don't we change our proposal so that we can accommodate something that we thought about? This is helping them. This is saving them. Best way to do that, the best way is 
figure out what they might protest and figure out what you might have in your back pocket, but don't save them. Let them come up to that. Let them decide what they can and cannot do. You have a negotiation budget, and this is a really fascinating concept from Jim Camp and his uh, Start With a No. Uh, so think about uh, the budget as consisting of three components, your time and energy, money and emotions. And it's a multiply, multiplying system. You start with time, and then you invest time and energy, and it's minimal investment. Put your money on the table, and then you invest in six time of what you used to. When emotions come up, you already adding the ante to 24. When emotions come up, everything is kind of start flying, right? So how does your budget compares with the real win? the money at stake. That's what you need to be always checking against. What am I bringing to the table? Am I spending only my money and energy? How that compares to my potential win? Am I starting throwing money at here, right? And throwing money at here might be lowering my rate as the coach. That's how you app your anti uh, in negotiation and you start negotiating against yourself. And then emotions, it's really easy for me to say, stay away from emotions. And I know we are emotion, emotional beings. Um, frankly, I don't know how to keep emotions out of negotiations rather than having really good, well-formed outcomes, staying really cool and knowing where to walk or what you can get out of this. So know not only your budget, but also your counterparty budget and see when they start getting deep into their budget. You want them to spend more and more out of their budget. You want to ask them more and more questions. That's spending their time and energy. Uh, you want to start price negotiation and start your kind of money started flying, uh, flying around, right? Um, Emotions go both ways is the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, right? Oh, and the expectations, right? So really wants to keep those in checks. Deadlines are your friends, surprisingly. Deadlines never let a good deadline go to waste. First of all, never work against the deadline. I frankly refuse to negotiate against the deadline. I understand that you have a deadline. However, I need to think about that and it will take me this amount of time. This is easy for me to say when I know that I don't need it. I want it, but I don't need it, so I will work on my time. However, if you have a deadline for a decision, if you have a deadline you're working against, the worst thing that I can do is to hide that deadline from the other party. Make your deadline visible and make it clear because otherwise they might be thinking they have a lot of time and they are moving at a slower pace and you are frantically working against this deadline and you start caving because you're running against this line, deadline. Make it visible. And remember that everything is movable. Deadlines are movable too. Don't take them as, well, I mean, line and sense are really easy to move. Don't take them as unmovable walls. Negotiate deadlines. Don't go for yes right away. Start with no, not, not yet. And because, because there are three types of yeses. One is counterfeit and you're asking somebody and say, they say, yeah, just go away. You got your yes. Have you benefit from that? Eh, I don't know, probably not. There is a confirmation when you ask that transactional question, that dreaded non-coaching transactional question and they tell you yes. You got a piece of information, but you're not benefiting from that. The only yes you are benefiting from is commitment yes. And we'll talk about what commitment yes look like and how you can get there. But before we go there, I would like you to think about one thing. How can you start embracing the no? No is dreadful. In our culture, no, it's like, Sometimes it's like slap in the face. And in some Asian cultures, it's absolute taboo to say no, right? But no is great. No, when you hear no, you might have heard like a slap of the uh, kind of slam door, right? And you're like, well, it's over. No, it's just a beginning because no might mean all these things that you see on screen, right? People just telling you that I can't afford it. It's uncomfortable to talk about that. I want to learn more. How do you work with all these things that people might be telling you with their no? 
and think about it, their frame of mind, actually saying no is very liberating. When you invite them to say no, you give them a semblance of control, a semblance of that I am in control, I can tell you no and, don't, and will not have any repercussions. You give them the right to veto and you create this partnership with your uh, negotiation adversary and you tell, you know what? I can walk from this table anytime, so can you. I give you power to say no. Please do if you feel like it. Moreover, not only embrace no, but invite no. So we probably all know this, hey, this is this and this from, from Hoofs and Horse Incorporated. Is this a good time to talk? Right? And people, yeah, eh, I cannot say no to that. Invite the no. Because the, when people say no, they feel this rush of, I'm in control. So try it on your next call. Turn your, turn your question into, is it a bad time to talk? Give them ability to start with no. Give them this control. Give them this act of autonomy, right? And again, I already said that, but I want to repeat that. Uh, some of you might cringe at this kind of hearing what I'm uh, what I'm saying, but uh, negotiation is like coaching. With the difference is that in coaching we use all those fantastic skills and competences we possess for the benefit of the client and for their awareness. While in negotiation we turn the skills around and onto our own service. We still want our counterparts, our adversaries, to feel safe and in control doesn't mean we give them control, we make them feel that. And in the driver's seat, where they are absolutely able to say no when they feel like that. And here's an easy trick for you to try. Ever send an email and then never heard from your uh, counterparty? Try this. Last time, uh, next time you send an email, you send like a second or third um, uh, follow-up email. Ask this simple question. Hey, haven't heard from you in a while. Have you given up on our project? And see what happens. Usually people, if they are still in the game, they will come back with no. No, but we're doing this and this, right? Again, it gives them safety and control. It's actually can be perceived as a veiled threat to leave. If you have given up on our project, I'm going. I have other things to do, right? And if you're a parent, you're probably actually exercising this. Like if your kid doesn't want to go uh, kind of leave the playground, right? Just, just say, okay, I'm going and start walking away and see what happens. Usually they will run after you, but some might not. Well. I have to catch, so I cannot actually speak for how kids behave on the playground. Start mastering your no, right? And why we might not want to say no is because we want to please our adversaries or we don't want to come across as rude. Uh, we have this social norm and cultures. When you say no, there are many ways of saying no without actually saying no, right? What you want to do, you want to watch your tone, right? Deliver how am I supposed to do this in a differential way and asking for help. Involve them in solving your problems. We talk about that. Avoid making a counter offer. With these ideas, uh, so you are great. Your offer is very generous. I'm sorry, that just won't work for me. You don't put anything else on the table. You actually invite them to be generous with that. And I'm sorry, kind of softens delivery and building empathy. Then if they still ask for that, you can go a little bit firmer and say, I'm sorry, I just cannot do that. It's me, it's not you, right? Builds more empathy with I'm sorry. And when you cannot do that, it again invites empathy and willingness to help. And at the, day, at the end of the day, when you have to say no, just be, be very uh, precise and uh, short. I'm sorry, no. With downward inflection and big fat, at, uh, big fat period at that. Delivery is a key here. I'm sorry, no. There's no further negotiation, right? And absolutely no, it's a no. Deliver it's firmly at the beginning. For example, if somebody asks you to do something that you absolutely know that you are not going to do that, we don't do that. Sorry. So now that we explored a lot of no's, let's get back to yeses. You remember the three ways, uh, the three kind of types of yeses, counterfeit, confirmation, and commitment. How do you know that yes is the commitment? 
The beauty of this Gene Camps 3 plus yeses uh, system is that it's so close to ICF actions and accountability competency, it's not even funny. That's what we actually do when we build these actions and accountability with our clients. Not only are we asking, so what are you going to do? We explore what's going to help them. We explore what's going to prevent them from doing that. We explore how what they're going to do will help them uh, move forward. We explore um, what can get in their ways and all that stuff, right? So I usually worry like uh, to kind of sound like a broken record, right? You don't ask the same question. So what are we going to do? Can you tell me again what we're going to do, right? So first, get them to say yes, right? Secondly, you can use the technique of summarization, reframing, uh, and kind of naming things, right? Just put it in a different light and have them say yes, right? And third way, how are we going to do that? How are we going to implement that? What are you going to do after we're done here? What is the first step? And notice these are all the questions that we probably usually ask in our actions and accountability part of coaching conversation, right? Uh, so all it's a good way to create accountability for them and to make sure that the yes that you are getting is actually the commitment yes rather than yeah just go away another fantastic uh, set of tools uh, if you are if you are coaching your clients uh, on influence or you're interested in uh, exerting influence uh, kind of without authority um, I highly recommend this book by uh, Rich, uh, Richard Kildini. He's a professor at Arizona State University and his fantastic work, uh, Influence, right? And these are... Uh, Hello! Weapons. All right, so Kathleen... <laughs> Did I say that loud enough? Yes, it was loud enough and there was no second. <laughs> so, so, so Sheree and I will reach out uh, and you will get your prize. Uh, okay, prize, thank you. Yeah, thanks for playing. All right. All right, so um, I'm not going too deep into each specific weapons, but you have them in your, um, in your arsenal. Sharpen them and have them on ready. Use reciprocity. The moment you give something, you create this need, the, this human need to reciprocate. That's a need that's almost physical need embedded in our culture. Get them to commitments. We want to we want to be seen as consistent. We want to be to flip flop on our decisions. Use that social proof. Look, we sell classes, we sell coaching, we have social proof on our uh, sites all day long. Figure out what social proof looks like. Whether it's your testimonials, whether it's the reference from the clients, whether it's your website, whether it's your social posting, right? A really good idea to find some similarities with your client. Right? Why would they like you? Have you gone to the same college? Do you have the same background? Have you come from the same town? Small things work, and they work in a very interesting ways. Authority is very interesting. Uh, so authority does not belong in coaching to start with. However, it's a huge weapon of influence behind the negotiation table. If you can pull that off, if you can use three letters after your name, use them. They are your friends. And then scarcity. This offer goes away in 24 hours. That's your immediate example of scarcity. And again, remember what we talked about the deadlines. Deadlines are your friends. Make deadlines work for you. Next really good thing, and this is absolutely fascinating things, um, these are, this is anchoring, right? And uh, I would invite you to uh, read Daniel Kahneman. Uh, he's absolutely fantastic work, Thinking Fast and Slow on Everything Biases. He has this app, so um, we can talk about, I can talk about anchoring for a long, long time and how it serves in the negotiation. Uh, he has this absolutely fantastic example how anchoring works in the economics they uh, actually had uh, two stores and two stores were running a promotion and two stores in the same kind of economic area with the same population more or less or comparable population and one store ran promotion um, let's say um, three items for the price of two or it, it was more like 10 items for the price of eight right and the other store ran promotional ran promotion that 
there's discount and limit 10. So what happened in the first case, the amount of purchases were significantly less than in the second. So when people are hit with this scarcity, and when we drop an anchor of the of the number, we are getting pulled to that number. For some reason, we just kind of, oh, 10, we need to get close to that 10 number, right? That also brings them, you, bring them to your world. You want to negotiate on your kind of terms, right? And if you want this price, drop your anchor. If you want the price of 500 uh, an hour, drop your anchor 500 to 1,000 and start negotiating there. Even if they had a completely different idea of 100 to 200, what might happen, they might say, I can't afford that. And then you go into negotiations and decide what you want to do. Or they might move and start negotiating uh, at, the, uh, at the higher base than they actually thought it would, negotiation would go at. Absolutely go for ranges. Don't go for a specific number. The moment you drop a number, you kind of tie to that number. First of all, it's your anchor as well. And secondly, ranges give you more flexibility. It gives, they give you freedom. And forget this Zoppa thing from, uh, from your MBA. Uh, it's, so it's, it's an acronym for zone of potential agreement. There's this idea that through negotiation, you can actually figure out this zone Let's say they have price range of 100 to 100 to 400, and you have price range of 350 to 600. So your zone, your Zoppa is 350 to 400. That's not working, to say the least, because Zoppa thinks that you can actually figure out what their zone is, what their pricing is. You can. You can ask absolutely powerful questions. You can be absolutely fantastic negotiator, and you won't figure that out. What's important is not to know their price. What's important is to know your value. And what, what's important is to know your goals and what you want out of this. Closing is gold. Never close. Always keep your options open. Always keep negotiation open. Because you know what? You closed it. They can come back. They can come back with a better deal. So uh, there's a caveat there. If you are negotiating a single, single point item, a single issue negotiations, this doesn't apply. If you are negotiating price only, you want the closed deal, you want signed contract, you want to take this price to the bank. If you are doing the right thing and negotiating multiple issues, you always want to keep negotiation open. Yes, you will sign the contract. Make sure that people know that look, if this doesn't work, we can open up negotiation because there are so many more chips on the table that we can take advantage of. For example, we uh, negotiated uh, a training contract, right? And there was, of course, the issue of price. We brought in the issue of frequency. We brought in the issue of trainer. We brought in the issue of sliding scale of the uh, of the profit uh, profit share and all that good stuff. You gotta get creative. Sometimes it just looks like the only thing we negotiate is price. That's the way to lose. That's the way to get yourself in a very bad situation. Figure out what else on the table. Figure out what your counterparty, what your adversary want and put that on the table and what might not be of a great value to you. This is an interesting one. Uh, as you are negotiating, as you're getting in the weeds, you might hear, ain't not fair. You are, you are negotiating unfairly with me, right? Uh, use, you can use this to your advantage, right? First of all, you can state your primary goal as fair and as equitable to all the parties involved. Use reciprocation weapon. Give them something of no value to you. It will trigger that reciprocation response. Even if they don't feel like giving anything to you, they might feel uncomfortable. They might feel a need to satisfy their need for reciprocation. Um, do the accusation audit. This one is fun one. Uh, so they might go and say, well, you are a jerk or you are jerking us around or you are negotiating fairly. Run ahead there accusations and say, you know what? In this negotiation or as we're talking about this, 
you might be thinking that I'm a jerk and the only thing I'm focusing on is money. And by the time we're done, you might be th thinking that I'm taking advantage of you. So if you do that, if you front run them with these words, they will feel the need to say, no, 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 no. We are great people. We are negotiating fairly. So when actually these thoughts hit them during the negotiation process, they will be conflicted. They already told you that you are not a jerk, that you are negotiating fairly. So create this conflict for them, right? And definitely forget win-win. There is no win-win. You cannot save the adversary. Work for yourself, know your value, know your goals, and get for that. So what happens if somebody drops that F-bomb? Somebody says it ain't fair. So First of all, don't get sucked into concession. Well, your price is not, your price of five bucks is not fair. Okay, I will give you four. Don't do that. You know your value. What you can do is basically to say, okay, I apologize. Let's go back where I started treating you unfairly and we will fix it. That invites more explanation of what they see as unfair. And usually it's not unfair. Usually it's their way to say, I'm not comfortable. I don't know enough. Whatever those no things mean that we had before. Another way uh, you might see this fair thing. Well, we gave you a fair offer. Great. We love fair offers. So fair, long coaching pause. Looks like you're ready to support it with data. Give me more information about your fair. And last but not least, negotiation is a competency as coaching is. You cannot read a book and become a great negotiator. Uh, you cannot go to, well, I, I did my accusation audit. And before starting this uh, webinar, I said, you are not going to be a great negotiator after listening to this. The only thing that can give you comfort and uh, more skills in negotiation is practice. Don't shun away from that. Negotiate, embrace it. Same thing as with politics in a corporation. If you want to be a great leader, if you want to run your business, if you want it to succeed, embrace negotiations. Here are some great reads that some, some of these I already mentioned. Thinking fast and slow is my go-to Bible. Uh, I read it three times and I'm slowly reading it four. Start with No by Jim Camp and Never Split the Difference are the foundational books for this presentation and everything that I know about negotiation. Influence the Psychology of Persuasion by Robert, Robert Cialdini. Really, really good read, really fun read, right? And uh, last is not as um, known, but also a good read about psychology and about psychology of negotiation. Thanks for arguing by Jay Hendricks. And with that said, uh, I would invite you to go to menti.com, www.menti.com one more time. And I would love your feedback. It's anonymous feedback. Uh, so I will not see the details who said that I sucked or my images were obnoxious or whatever. So please go to menti.com and enter code 160849 and let's take these couple of minutes to provide your feedback would love that www.menti.com and code is 160849 and as you are doing that i am open to any questions if there are any questions um thank you so much for listening Thanks for inviting me. Alex, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today and your passion and exper expertise around the topic. Um, we really, really appreciate it. Actually, it looks like we do have one question that came in. What suggestions do you have for when we are on the receiving end of some of these tactics? Name them. <laughs> Name them. I know what you're doing. I, appreci I appreciate your willingness to negotiate. Yeah. I see what you're doing. Right. So what do you want to do with that? Right. So, for example, if they are if they are using weapon of reciprocation, well, don't give in. If they are using three yeses, that's probably your friend because you already <laughs> agreed to that. If they are going for no, embrace saying no, because it's great. It's great on both sides. It's not some mind Jedi trick. 
it actually works, right? How can I do that? Well, it's your choice what you want to achieve. As long as you keep in mind your goal, you might actually want to help your adversary to design an action plan that will use you, that will use uh, um, this as an opportunity to get into uh, maybe their enterprise. So if they are basically saying, okay, so you know our budget constraints and all that, how can we do that? Maybe give them some ideas that you have. So for example, when we are signing with corporations and you're going for a decision maker, a good idea is not to sign one SOW, but a series of SOWs and not to go for their maximum signing uh, authority. Figure out their signing authority and maybe suggest, okay, you don't go up to the limit. How can we go and sign several statement of works? Right. Make sure that you recognize that and you use that to your advantage. <laughs> well, silence is gold, you know. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to uh, be with ICF uh, North Texas.